a very expert panel, um, and I have reams of information about all three of them, which I'm going to try and condense a little bit, otherwise we'll be here all evening before we even get started. Um, so first of all, uh, Professor Misha Dola, uh, next to me here in the red, is Professor in Wireless Communications at King's College London, um, and he was Director of the Centre for Telecommunications Research at King's from 2014 to 2018. He is a Fellow of the IEEE, the Royal Academy of Engineering, the Royal Society of Arts, I don't know if you're going to talk about that as well, um, the Institution of Engineering Technology, and a distinguished member of Harvard Square Leaders Excellence. And he acts as a policy advisor on issues relating to digital skills and education, has a dozen patents, and has co authored several books. Um, I think that'll do, uh, Michelle. I hope that's enough. So um, hang on, I'm, I'm going to, shall I go on and introduce the other two first? And then quickly. All right. So um, then in the middle we've got Ichiro Seto, um, who is Deputy Director of Toshiba Research Europe Limited, uh, based in Bristol. Um, so he worked at Toshiba's Corporate Research and Development Centre uh, in Kanagawa Prefecture, um, out of university. Spent a year as a visiting researcher at the Berkeley Wireless Research Centre at the University of California. And uh, then for about five years he was in Tokyo uh, in the semiconductor business division of Toshiba, designing and promoting CMLS wireless transceivers. And he came to the UK in 2017, uh, where he is deputy manager uh, directing for Toshiba Research Europe Limited in Bristol. And he has uh, even more patents, 40, uh, over 40 patents, and uh, is also a member of the Institute of Electrical Information and Communication Engineers, Japan, and the IEEE USA, and has a number of awards. And then our third speaker is going to be Dr. Federico Boccardi. Um, he is a Principal Technology Advisor uh, at Ofcom, the uh, UK Communications Regulator, um, where he leads the work on 5G. Um, and he has history working at Bell Labs uh, and at Vodafone's R&D division. And he's got 25 patents, so that's around 25 patents, so somewhere in the middle. Uh, and has published about 80 uh, international research papers, um, and he's received various awards. Um, he's a member of the Industrial Advisory Board for the Department of Informatics at King's London, and an honorary visiting professor at the University of Bristol, and a fellow of the IET. So, um, as you can see, they're a very eminent and expert panel, and without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Misha to take the topic. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My voice is a bit squeaky. I just about recuperated it for this event, so you know, it gets a bit uh, quiet in the background. Just tell me, I'll use the microphone then, okay? Um, so the uh, the internet actually has come a really long way. If you think about it, you know, we started with the uh, designing the wide internet. We have fiber out of every single computer on the planet today, and it's powering major parts of our economy today. Now, after we designed the uh, fixed internet, we started building mobile internet, and uh, we started to see uh, generations like 2G, 3G, 4G, and now 5G emerge. And uh, you know, we're going to be talking about 5G quite a bit, uh, but it's essentially a progression as we came from 2G. Now, we also did another internet after we have connected every single mobile phone because we thought, you know, what can we connect now? And we started to think, hey, why don't we connect? things and we started to build a things internet uh, or we call that the internet of things and uh, that's come a very long way as well and the technology will be rolled out and hopefully connect every single sense and actuator over the next decades to come um, but at some point of course people started to ask you know what's the next internet we're going to be building and then in 2014 I had an inspiration at the height of the Ebola crisis because King's College London was leading UK's response down in Sierra Leone and uh, they were coming back our doctors and saying we 
need more medical skills. We need people to help us down there. Nobody dare to travel into uh, into that trouble zone. So I thought, hey, why don't we connect, you know, a, a real doctor to this to this trouble zone uh, using ultra low latency type of networks, uh, edge robotics, and a bit of AI on top. Um, and uh, you know, I, I I gave it a name and I called it the Internet of Skills in 2014. Um, and I thought once operational, it could actually totally democratize how we uh, execute skills on the planet. And you know, the design has come a long way, um, and people are now jumping on this design bandwagon. And people told me it's a bit like you know, Industry 4.0, and those who are skilled in the arts will know what Industry 4.0 means. It essentially means we are optimizing manufacturing halls, we are putting sensors everywhere, these sensors get a lot of data in real time, we process that data and then control the machinery in a much more optimized way, uh, everything becomes more uh, efficient. Uh, um, but there's a problem with that, of course. The first problem is it's not an internet. Okay, we're not building the internet here. We're building a local area network for the factory. Local area networks have not worked. In the 90s, we had them, and they haven't really disrupted this planet. What really changed uh, the global economy was the internet. Okay. Second problem of that slide is there's no human in there. We are building technology which is empowering machines. Why would we do that? Right? We really want to build technology which empowers you. Whatever you're good at. If you're good at playing the piano, teach people someone in the world how to play. If uh, you're good at painting, teach me because I'm very bad at painting, okay? And you don't need to travel in the future anymore. We'd be able to transmit that skill set from any point to any other point uh, in the world without actually needing to travel. We can't do it today. The internet today only allows us to transmit audio, video, and uh, HTML files, uh, you know, maybe your bank statements. You cannot transmit touch. You cannot transmit muscle movement. You can't do it. Um, and one of the reasons you can't do it because the networks are too slow. When you transmit uh, you know, action, you need a reaction within about 10 milliseconds, simply because of the stability of the system. Imagine a surgeon doing surgery, and uh, he or she doesn't get the information quickly enough back and uh, cuts actually an artery. Okay? I was told cutting arteries is not a good thing. I'm not a doctor, but apparently it's not a good thing. So therefore, we need that very, very quick feedback coming back. Can't do it today. Okay? So your networks are extremely slow. 5G came along and changed that whole ecosystem. Right? And that's why I'm a big fan of 5G. 5G for me is just a small puzzle in a much larger design uh, construct I'm doing here. But it's an important construct because it was the last puzzle we were missing. And uh, just to put you a little bit in context here what the delay really means, um, we, each of these boxes is 10 milliseconds. And we need to do everything within 10 milliseconds. Okay, everything. So this is not local area. That means from London to Los Angeles, uh, from Auckland to Beijing, uh, from uh, Tokyo to wherever you want to go, you need to be able to get things going within 10 milliseconds. We have a human vortex and the stability of action reaction to touch how we work is geared towards that. Okay? Now, here's a challenge, right? Let, let's go London and LA. I work with Los Angeles quite a bit. So that's the delay. You get loads of these 10 millisecond boxes. Uh, you get loads of these green ones here, which is, uh, we call it application delay. So it turns out that what your mobile phone, your computer, take a lot of time to compress the video and the audio. You don't realize that, but actually it's within, you know, 60, 70, 100 milliseconds uh, of time duration, right? So the other problem we have is, is our network. So again, when you have a Skype call, you kind of got used to 200 milliseconds delay, you kind of adapted to it, but you don't have that feeling of immediacy you and I have right now here in the audience by us physically being together, right? So we don't have it because we have that delay. And, and the network's very slow. About 50% of the delay happens in urban London, in metropolitan London. The uh, switches and routers are congested, you know, everybody's uh, working. So the pack just for a, 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 a piece of video a signal to get out of London takes, you know, half of these boxes, you know, 36 to 40, 45 milliseconds. Then it's on the, uh, on the highway, uh, across the Atlantic, it's all good. It arrives in Los Angeles, metropolitan uh, area, same story again. You know, we have loads of yellow boxes. And then, of course, you have Something was really annoying, speed of light. So I went to my physics, physics colleagues and, uh, and Kings asked them whether we can actually do something about it. But apparently, it is a really fundamental constant. So we can't do anything about the speed of light. Sadly, right? So we need to get around this. So how do you get uh, something which is actually, you know, I had to cut it somewhere down there, uh, 200 milliseconds, 160 milliseconds down to 10 milliseconds. Well, here comes the magic. I could, of course, talk about this for hours and hours. That's what they're paying me for at King's College in London. Uh, but I'll just show you what we are roughly doing. You know what? To get rid of 
the delay you get by coding and decoding video, you know what we're going to do is we're just not going to do it at all anymore. Right? Let's not compress. We call it compression. We do we encode because we compress the signal. Let's not compress it anymore. Right? You gain a lot of time yeah. Um, then we have 5G on the yellow boxes here. So 5G, the thing we're going to be talking about today, really helps you because we are able now uh, in a fully softwareized infrastructure to slice essentially a, what we call a data high lane for very specific packets, right? So if you know that you have a very low latency surgery uh, packet coming because somebody's doing surgery, you instruct every single switch and router in the internet on the way to LA to let this packet through by jumping the queue which may have built up, okay? It's essentially building a high lane. We're able to do that uh, and on the click of a mouse click. So that's really a big fundamental change. And then speed of light, we're beating with artificial intelligence. We do a lot of prediction. We're trying to predict how would the surgeon conduct the operation. Uh, we're doing this in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles, we would uh, try to uh, predict essentially how the environment uh, reacts to the surgeon doing certain uh, 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 cuttings in the tissue, right? So um, that AI is being used already today in games. So I'm not sure you're a crowd which plays Fortnite. There's a game called Fortnite. Maybe you play that, right? So um, when you play with somebody from Australia or from Tokyo, for the uh, sake of the example, uh, of course, we don't have time uh, for 40 milliseconds for the uh, signal to arrive if you're doing actually stuff together as a group. So there's a lot of AI doing that prediction for you already in the background, right? So we put it all together, and it turns out we're getting it down to uh, 10 milliseconds. Uh, we're currently at about 20 milliseconds, but we're we confident we can get it down to 10 milliseconds. So we build an internet where, from no matter where you are, right, you can actually get latencies down to, to the point where you can do suddenly a lot of magic. So um, unfortunately, you couldn't come to King's today. I uh, tried to put the event there, but uh, so I'll show you what we have. Uh, we build the whole infrastructure. That's our view. You know, House of Parliament, London Eye. For some reason, we only have one eye in London. Never mind. Uh, there's a 5G antenna here. Um, you can barely see it. So we go now to the other side of the, uh, of the Strand campus, and we look up onto the roof, and you see there's a 3.5 gigahertz 5G antenna and a millimeter wave antenna here. There's interestingly no processing going on. All the processing is done in the basement. So there's a fiber, a very thick fiber, going down into the basement doing all the processing. And um, we work, our hardware is provided by Ericsson. But interestingly, do you see the name here? It's Dell. It's a commodity item. So what before cost you a million pounds to get a very specific rack of hardware to support your telco infrastructure, whether you got it from Huawei, from Nokia, or Ericsson. Now I went to the Strand, okay, and out of the shop, I bought some servers. I put them down there. Everything's now in software. It's magic, okay? It's pure magic. Before you need to call and want to change, you went to uh, the vendors and said, you know, I would like to have a little change. They said, no problem. Ten years back, uh, ten years later, they come with a new box. Okay? So here you go. Now, uh, the internet doesn't work like this, right? We have very quick innovation cycles. Telecoms finally has caught up, and that's for me the biggest breakthrough in 5G, actually, apart from having a system which is, you know, ten times quicker, ten times lower latency, uh, 10 times more devices, you know, it's, everything is just improving by one or two words of value, which is great. But the real, real transformation is, is we've gone from hardware, purpose-made hardware, to actually kind of open source type of hardware with software on top. And software is great, scales much better, uh, innovation happens much quicker, and actually the UK is very good at it as well, so there's a good chance that a lot of the 5G kind of B2B companies come out of uh, out, of the, out of the UK. So really, really excited about this. And actually, I, I knew this uh, already quite a while back, and when we were awarded this big government grant to build the uh, UK's first 5G system along with Bristol University and Surrey University, I took, the, uh, uh, I took a very big bet. I didn't hire a single telecom engineer. I only hired computer scientists, okay? I played out because they're the only ones who actually do it. It's really working uh, prototype in time. The others as well, but the full, full system. So here you go, right? Big transformation. Now, rather than bore you with uh, technology, I thought, you know what? I'm going to show you what we did with that tech. Um, because with my companies, I kind of realized there's a huge difference between uh, uh, need and demand, right? So need is, is it great to have 5G? Uh, demand is, would somebody pay for that? Okay? There's always a big difference between need and demand. And so to make sure that the uh, companies and the consumers in 2019 would appreciate what 5G really means. In 2014, 15, I started to engage with artists, you know, with uh, with surgeons, with consumer groups to really make sure that uh, you know we have kind of a co-creation story. Very difficult, of course. How do you how do you tell a surgeon, you know, you go into an operating theater, say, 
excuse me, sir, do you, do you think you will need 5G? So this is how we started our, our discussions, right? And what came out is actually magic. Um, and I'm going to talk you through some of these use cases. Um, and uh, I'm going to skip this one, if you don't mind. I'm going to show you this one here. So that was led by uh, one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Mahmoud. Uh, she's a, um, an, uh, an academic in, in our center, our current uh, head, of, our head of the center. And what we wanted to show here really is the ability to control very critical things through the internet. So we have the big industrial drone flying in the courtyard of kings, okay? And we, uh, we, we invited a person who is a real skilled person to fly drones. And what we didn't tell the person is, is that actually he wasn't directly controlling the drone. The signal good went from his remote control to, to a 5G base station, was sliced to New York, came all the way back, and was only then controlling the drone. He didn't realize it. Okay? So he was flying very critical infrastructure across the planet. That's exactly what we wanted to show. Not a local air network, not all the use cases you see with drones where you have a local 5G network. That's not what we want. We want across the planet. You can think now of loads of exciting applications. Imagine there's an emergency, a landslide, uh, there's a disaster happening somewhere in the world. Instead of flying everybody in, all the best pilots in the world could deliver medicine, food, uh, water, etc., etc. We can do it. The technology can do it because of the low latency we're able to establish. What else? Then we have a really interesting one with uh, medicine. Listen to this one. So this is Proca talking. Uh, he's, uh, we need to surgeon. disrupt the way we see medical treatment. If you see an open surgeon operating, they will have a bit of tremor at the ends of their scalpel. The robotic instruments are computerized, so they have absolutely no tremor. There is one problem though. There is no sense of touch at the end of the instruments it is very difficult to transmit across remote distances and across current robotic systems. In order to do this with haptic feedback technology, you need two things. You need network slicing and you need cloud data sharing. I think both are possible through 5G. It also allows us to bring the best education internationally to the next generation of doctors. I'm going to stop it here, so the video is a bit longer. It's, it's phenomenal. It's a don't you agree? It's a practicing surgeon who's normally in the surgery, doing surgery, talking about 5G cloud technology, edge cloud. It's because we've worked very closely together. This Proca is a pioneer in robotic surgery. It happens to be at King, so it's very easy for him to collaborate. But the idea is essentially to separate the place where you actually, the doctor with the high end skill is now doing the operation where, versus where the patient is, right? So um, I got a lot of bad press for this four years back. But God is very quick these days, okay? Mobile World Congress in Barcelona this year. It's the first time they showed it commercially working. And we see uh, a huge amount of business cases on where we would have patients in very needy areas in the world who don't have access to high-end hospitals actually having a low-end type of surgery device which isn't too expensive or a mobile unit even and then use the best surgeon according to the availability around the clock to perform these type of operations, right? So it's happening today and it's very, very exciting. Apart, you know, I'm cutting out really 90% of all the beautiful things we did here because we also give them big, back the, the sense of touch, but these are the type of capabilities we have. As, a, as an add-on, we have now a quite a big project here with, uh, with Hong Bin. He's uh, one of our robotics academics. He's uh, pioneering a lot of the soft robotics, so we're helping again to build devices which connect with a 5G uh, 5G system between hospitals, essentially very low end, um, um, low end hospitals in the urban area with high end hospitals in sorry low end hospitals in the suburban area and the rural areas with high end hospitals in the urban area um, to help calling cancer detection. So we think really this is one of the uh, the first use cases where 5G will save lives. Again, you need ultra low latency um, to make that happen. So that's covered. If you want, I can send you that link in the Financial Times. Uh, let's move on, uh, shift gear a little bit. Let's go to the arts world. So um, with Ericsson, we did an interesting one here in the Hermitage in St. Petersburg. I'm not sure you um, you know that uh, you know that that's a bit like the uh, you know the National Gallery in a sense. Um, one of the most world's famous uh, art restaurateur is actually active there, and uh, we told him, hey, it would be great if you could maintain artwork whilst actually you know not going to risky areas like Iraq and Syria. Um, he was against it, but 5G gave him the ability to be fully immersed because of the uh, immersed because of the wide bandwidth and uh, and really connected because of the very low latency. So and uh, so he was in full control of the. Uh, of then we worked a bit with um, so Zoran is one of our professors here. Is actually my office mate. 
He developed the Tolvin audio technology, which is a uh, fully spatial audio technology, which allows you essentially to uh, reproduce audio signals at a high precision and very low complexity. Um, and we recorded some stuff with, uh, he recorded stuff with Zhu Wang, uh, number one uh, female uh, concert pianist, if you know her, as well as Rapes One, he's a uh, number one beatboxer. Um, and we have seen now currently how can we use the flexibility of the 5G infrastructure to cloudify essentially this tech so we can move it forth and back. So some, another application. I'm gonna finish with this one here. It's a very, um, my personal one as I call it. Let's listen to this. And then, uh, So I'm playing under the Brandenburger Tour in Berlin. And this young lady there, she's at the Guildhall in London, 1,000 kilometers separation. Okay? And uh, with this 5G drum the technology, the, the slicing and everything I explained to you, we managed to get a lot of 20 milliseconds. But to put that in context, for the sound file to come out of my hard disk, it's about 36 to 37 milliseconds. And we managed to get actually end-to-end -end between two countries. Two milliseconds. So it felt that Noah was actually just right beside me. She could adapt in real time to my uh, piano speed, my playing speed, and I could adapt to her. She could adapt to the pitch, etc. Really phenomenal. Very, very emotional night. Also because community, she is my daughter, right? So they were down, <laughs> thousand kilometers apart. Uh, two countries with very diff different political spectrum at the moment. But again, you know, technology brought us together and music brought us together. And what I showed you here is essentially the possible applications of what we can do with this future public internet. Before we needed very expensive fiber lines, it's going to be public internet. You know? As of end of this year, you can do this and so much more with 5G to come. I'll leave that all to you for exciting applications. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Misha-san. So uh, I'm really excited to hear about so, uh, so future dream based on 5G. So my talk is uh, based on like uh, engineering uh, side. So uh, today I'd like to talk about so uh, what 5G is, and also I'd like to introduce like a few trial situation in Japan. And uh, recent topic so uh, we have discussed in Japan, I'd like to explain. And finally, uh, I'm inserted one technology so section uh, to explain network slicing. This is a very uh, focused area. So to introduce a 5G, and finally, I like to summarize my talk. So uh, almost all uh, persons would imagine so Toshiba produces uh, like a TV or a Note PC or a home appliance. But besides, so Toshiba has produced uh, all, uh, many kinds of infrastructure business for a long time. So our infrastructure business uh, consists of four sections. The first one is, uh, so uh, we have produced uh, like uh, infrastructure systems, so which includes like uh, water supply system, train cargo, uh, toll gate, also broadcasting system, and uh, like uh, cellular base stations. And the second one is uh, we have produced the uh, energy system. And the third one is the semiconductor supply, like uh, memory or uh, battery. And finally, so we have produced uh, like industrial IoT solutions. So which is based on information and communication technologies. And regarding 5G, 
so this industrial IoT is really related to so uh, uh, 5G technologies. Okay, so uh, before talking about 5G, so I like to introduce so uh, my office. So uh, Toshiba has uh, global corporate R&D facilities. Uh, which has located in, of course, in Japan and in USA, China, Vietnam, India, and also in UK. So in UK, so uh, we have two locations, uh, which are Cambridge and Bristol. I'm coming from Bristol, so Bristol Research Innovation Laboratory has focused on wireless and RF technology and also industrial IoT platform. Okay, so I'd like to move on to the section of what 5G is. So uh, we like to look back on cellular evaluation history in Japan. So in 1979, the first uh, cellular system has been introduced. So uh, and also, uh, so we are going to look through. Uh, so uh, first generation, <coughs> second generation, the third generation, the fourth generation. So uh, every 10 years. So uh, from 1980s, 1990s, 2000, 2010, 2020, every 10 years, great evolution has been done since the start in 1979. So uh, in 2020, so the fifth generation is supposed to start. So uh, many kinds of applications have been introduced, so uh, related to uh, the advanced technology of cellular systems. Recently, we have expected so like uh, photo or video or web browser or high resolution video based on 4G. And next, 5G, so what service come? That is a very big topic. And uh, uh, this slide shows a use scenario based on 5G, which is approved in International Telecommunication Union in 2015. So remarkable feature in 5G is uh, defining three representative services on the same platform. The first one is uh, enhanced mobile broadband, which produces a high speed, like a 10 gigabps or something. And also the second one is a massive machine type communications, which so provide a high density network based on 5G. And last one, ultra reliable and low latency communications. And uh, regarding 5G, so uh, I'd like to say the big difference from the previous generation is this feature of ultra reliable and low latency. That makes uh, many kinds of applications to be produced. And also uh, this performance can penetrate so industrial side, such kind of like uh, uh, industry automation and the mission critical applications. So as a Toshiba, so we have produced many kinds of infrastructure business system. So my our interest is actually so industrial automation and the mission critical applications. Okay, so uh, how 5G is great so in terms of uh, reliability and latency. So I'd like to explain so uh, performance portfolio uh, against uh, other communication scheme. This graph shows a portfolio so with uh, reliability and latency. So many kinds of so communication protocol has been developed, but uh, 5G has a very sophisticated and advanced performance. So uh, 5G can provide a lower latency, which is less than 10 milliseconds or less, and also uh, provide a higher reliability, which is a 99.999% or more. This reliability means 99.999% means, uh, for example, uh, once uh, we are communicating, so uh, 10 times in a second, so for 10 years, only one error is permitted. So this 99.999% is a really, really so advanced performance. And this 5G can realize this so uh, very great so reliability. So, so uh, communication, wireless communication can be applied into uh, like a remote operation or uh, so uh, emergency applications. 
Okay, so uh, uh, I'd like to describe how industrial internet evaluation is. So uh, Germany government has pushed forward uh, Industry 4.0, so which is based on connected and uh, AI technologies. So uh, regarding the introduction of 5G, we can expect the next generation, which is beyond Industry 4.0, and also society 5.0 in Japan. So we call so uh, beyond industry 4.0 is society 5.0. So that is based on wireless, virtual, distributed, mobile to realize robotics autonomous system networks. This next generation uh, in industrial internet evaluation expects so remote operation or haptics or tactile internet. I'd like to so, uh, introduce some few trial examples. So, uh, led by Japanese government organization, Minister of Information and Communications, several field trial of 5G has been proceeded since 2017. So, the table shows a part of this field trial. The point is, uh, so yeah, this table shows uh, like uh, overview of a field trial, like uh, high realistic sensation video streaming, remote medical examination, or remote control for construction machine or something. But uh, yeah, the point is, uh, so uh, half or more portion of uh, target is an uh, industrial side, so uh, not in consumer user side. So that means the 5G field trial have been directed to a development of industrial market. That is a very big difference so from the previous era of 4G. So 5G is really expected to use in industrial market. <coughs> so uh, picking up three topics I'd like to explain. The first one is <coughs> for the case of uh, remote medical examinations. 5G is connected uh, between a university of medical in urban area and a physician so office in a uh, rural area. So 5G produces a high uh, video streaming, high resolution video streaming to show like an examination scene for patients and also measured data of patients. Doctor, uh, looking through that video and scenes or measured data so providing uh, like a diagnosis <coughs> and also uh, like uh, advice to patient so uh, this kind of high video streaming also like uh, low latency communication can provide uh, like a remote examinations the second one is uh, the example of uh, remote control for construction machines so uh, these workers are uh, trying to remote controlling of crane uh, equipment, so we are one kilometer apart from the field. So uh, 5G can provide uh, so high resolution video so transfer and also a uh, very, very low latency to control signal to be sent from workers to crane machine. So remote workers can control so through 5G. And also final so example is a tandem autonomous truck. So uh, to, uh, for the purpose to realize this kind of autonomous truck, so high video streaming and also low latency and high reliable control is required, 5G can realize that. So uh, applying so uh, 5G, so uh, vehicle to network to vehicles communication can realize only just uh, one millisecond or less. So that makes uh, remote control achieved. Okay. Okay. So I'd like to talk about hot topic we have discussed in Japan. So. Uh, I'd like to explain some issues to introduce 5G in Japan, so against market requirements. There are much expectations to 5G, for example, diversity of service, communication service 
targets are not only phone users in urban, but everything in even rural or industrial area. And also a quick installation for local problems so far or revitalization of local communities. So there are so many expectations to 5G, so, and many users would like to introduce 5G. So in addition to market led by general cell operators, the concept of local 5G has been attracting uh, much attention. Local 5G means so uh, self-organized uh, cellular systems, so which is operated in local. So everyone can introduce 5G systems, so we don't need to rely on cellular operators. That concept is a very new one. And uh, this local 5G uh, consists of two features. So uh, the first one is a micro coverage concept is introduced, which is for easily expanding into specific areas. The second one is uh, Japanese government uh, try to assign frequency band for this local 5G. So uh, at the moment we have now discussed uh, so how large of bandwidth will be provided for local 5G. At the moment, so 200 megahertz on 4.6 gigahertz and 900 megahertz on 28 gigahertz are candidates. <coughs> this bandwidth is uh, almost one third of total 5G bands. That means a uh, really high expectation uh, is coming from market. We are still negotiating with the other markets like uh, satellite communication to get to this frequency band. But maybe in 2020, 100 megahertz on 28 gigahertz and 20 megahertz on 2.5 will be open to trial. So uh, that is a very big uh, advance. So in Japan, so local 5G is a groundbreaking attempt because so, uh, local 4G is prohibited. So in Japan, this is a first attempt and a very big so uh, step because uh, so license is provided for everyone to use 5G. Okay, I'm going to so uh, explain what local 5G is. So uh, the unique point is, as I said, so licensing autonomous communities or landowners to be able to operate 5G. So uh, pink coverage and uh, purple colored coverage are conventional service area led by cellular operators. And uh, in fixed uh, and isolated area, this is a self-organized area, so which is operated by, so uh, for example, land owner or a business uh, building owner or something. Yeah. So. Uh, this can permit uh, specific subscribers uh, to communicate. So, in addition to other subscribers to <coughs> all the ordinary so cellular operators. So, uh, as an internal summary, so a local 5G will be introduced in required area, isolated area, with optimum coverage size by business operators. So if you have some interest in use local 5G, so you can apply so to get this license of 5G. Of course, there are some so uh, steps so, to be uh, permitted to get, but uh, everyone has uh, some potential to claim and to apply this license. And the self-operated local cellular system can be effectively spread to enhance business. So uh, because we don't rely on cellular operators. So that is a very, very, very big attempt in Japan. Of course, so there are still many kinds of technical objectives so remain to realize local 5G. So regarding requirements to utilize 5G, so inside, for example, on building or to utilize it on own area. So we have two approaches. So the first one is uh, we are going to own base station by ourselves, or uh, we are going to make some contract to use point-to-point -point support from base stations outside. So, but uh, of course, so uh, 
there are issues, for example, uh, how to suppress so radio leakage outside of the area. So uh, isolating radio is a very diff difficult one. So uh, isolated area is a very important to provide a local 5G. And also uh, how to cover separated area effectively, or how to realize coexistence for different service. For example, high speed or low latency or something. So there are still many kinds of uh, issues we have solved. But uh, so uh, we need to prepare some provision against uh, these issues. This is a, so uh, the picture, exam, uh, this is an example. I uh, watched some so local 5Gs uh, from Nokia exhibition in Hanover, Messe. So uh, inside the store age, so a uh, base station has been introduced, and this local 5G can connect every equipment so, uh, in wireless. So uh, easy layout can be done because of a 5G can connect with a low latency and high reliability. So uh, many operators are of course also interested in introduce local 5G and many industrial side also would like to use this local 5G. Okay, so uh, I'd like to move to the final section. So uh, uh, there are many kinds of technology study toward 5G, so but picking up one of them, so uh, I'd like to sh uh, explain network slicing technology. So which uh, can realize coexistence of different services. In 5G, so uh, three categorized representative applications are uh, planned to support. So uh, video transfer of high speed, remote control with low latency, and uh, data collection under high density. So uh, network uh, of conventional concept cannot support quality of service for each of so, uh, these three applications because so, uh, quality of service is a truly different one. So a conventional network cannot support. But uh, the concept of network slicing provides a big feature. So uh, allocating communication packets in resource of frequency and time domain, which can be controlled independently against each service, quality of service are guaranteed. That is a very big impact so for realizing coexistence. So for example, a video transfer low latency, that can realize a remote operations or a remote control for anything. So uh, actually this concept is uh, really against the present internet concept. The present internet concept is rely on like one uh, size fits everything. But uh, this is a very customized network concept. So uh, this is a very different concept from the previous one. But uh, recognizing context in each service communication platform can realize coexistence. So this is very big impact. So uh, we, uh, I'm coming from research division. So uh, my colleagues has studied so in network slicing. So applying our developed network slicing technology, so uh, so we have achieved some improvement in terms of uh, collision probability or uh, access delay. That leads to uh, like a latency and a high reliability. So this graph shows uh, with the parameter of uh, reliability. So uh, this uh, vertical access means uh, latency. So our developed protocol can achieve so less than 10 millisecond latency with the reliability of 99.99. So uh, such a kind of so approach is still required to enhance uh, latency and reliability. So many academic and many uh, companies have studied eagerly so about this network slicing technologies. So I skipped for technical detail, but uh, if there are somebody so who would like to uh, inter interesting, so please look through these kind of journal and conference papers. Yeah. 
Okay, so finally let me summarize my talk. So uh, Cellular fifth generation is about to be launched in 2020 in Japan and also in UK. So there are three representative applications. So high speed, low latency, and uh, massive machine type. It means high density. So uh, industrial market also expects to introduce 5G, especially local 5G. So low latency feature for wireless control would have a big impact, which is very different from the previous generation, to realize many kinds of mobile robot vehicle in wide coverage area. So uh, many kinds of applications have been discussed in entertainment and in industrials. So today I don't mention about uh, entertainment, so, uh, but uh, of course in the market of entertainment, 5G is really expected to realize uh, uh, virtual reality or augmented reality, and also uh, yeah, many kinds of ap applications. Thank you very much. While, uh, while we prepare the presentation, I want to say it's a real pleasure for me to be here tonight because I love Japan and because I tied with Japan. My, my wife is Japanese, so uh, she brought some words for me to introduce this presentation, so I'll try my Japanese tonight. So she's... <laughs> Mina san konnichiwa. Huh? What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> Don't you kidding, kidding. <laughs> Speak a bit of basic Japanese. So, and um, so I work for the uh, UK communication regulator. And our job is to make communications work for everyone in UK. So, the services that Misha presented, and Ichiro presented, our, our job is that they not only work between London or New York, London and Los Angeles, but also between London and a small village in, in, in Wales or in Scotland. And this is what my presentation is about tonight. And actually, 5G has already launched in UK. It was launched uh, one week ago. The first operator to launch uh, in UK was EE, just in a few cities. And just the first wave is going to take years and years to, to get to the point that is the main technology. And uh, the other three operators will be launching between now, between this summer and, and the end of the year. That doesn't mean by, uh, by the end of this year you're going to be able to enjoy those services. It's going to take a bit more time. In particular because there will be many two ways of 5G. One first way that is more similar to 4G, which, which means as 4G but faster and better. And the second way will be the, the low latency reliability wave. And only at that point you're going to be able to, to enjoy some of these services. The other speak talk about but I'm going to start with 4G, actually, because I wanted to show you how 4G looks like in UK today. I think after seven years since its launch in UK. And, um, and green is where you have a good coverage, and, and yellow is where you have a bad coverage. And, and bad coverage in, in this slide is defined as data speed that are lower than 2 megabit per second. So we went from speaking about 10 gigabit per second, 1 gigabit per second, to <coughs> 2 megabit per second. And my message is that there are places in UK where even today you can only reach 2 megabit per second. So there is a lot we need to do, in particular in rural areas, and in hard to, to reach areas. But hard to reach areas are not only rural areas. If you think about coming to Waterloo by a train uh, in UK, you know, so sometimes there is a very bad coverage, you cannot have uh, you cannot connect, not even for downloading an email. I know in Japan it's very different. In Japan, trains are much better, and connectivity in trains is much better, but there is a lot we need to do here. And um, there is a slide about fixed networks, which is a bit it's strange, because this presentation is about mobile networks, but the reason why I wanted to also give you a slide about uh, fixed networks is because from a consumer perspective, it doesn't matter uh, whether some of these services are coming from 5G or from any other technologies, all consumers want to be available to uh, enjoy some of these services. Think about you using virtual reality or 
being connected to your GP uh, at distance, all, all your mind is that your, this works in your place, now there is 5G or Wi-Fi or other or any other technology. And uh, what this slide slides says is that uh, there are still um, all UK, there are still 2% of places that are not, to, not able to get a decent broadband. And again, decent broadband is defined as 10 megabit per second download and 1 megabit per second upload. So it's very, very basic. And if you think about uh, uh, ultra fast, ultra fast is 300 megabit per second, which means with 300 megabit per second, assuming there is a low latency, you might be able to um, enjoy some of the services that in the previous presentation we are defined as 5G services, but if you get, if you get to the speed of the feed, of the full fiber, you might be able to uh, receive some of the services via Wi-Fi, for example. So going back to um, to 5G now, these are some of the actions we are doing to uh, make sure or to enable the services not only in London or Bristol or or, or other major cities in UK, but also in uh, in more hard to reach places. First of all, uh, on the left side, we are supporting uh, MNOs investment. In UK, there are four main MNOs, and uh, we need to support them because today, those are uh, 4G services are deployed by MNOs. The the main uh, way we do it is by uh, providing new spectrum bands, and I want to come back to this later in the presentation. But this is not the only way. We also need to keep an eye on the balance between competition and uh, releasing spectrum. Um, but with 5G, uh, it's not only about MNO, it's not only about traditional services delivered by traditional players, but it's also about new services delivered by new players. Um, and we saw in the second presentation about services provided by local players. And part of what we've been doing in the last years is to completely change the way we have de delivered Spectrum in a way to enable these new services and to lower the barriers for new entrants in the market. And again, I want to come back to this. And the third part is about hard to reach places. We discussed rural areas, um, but it's also about indoor. Because one of the things 5G is doing is, is using higher frequencies. And higher frequencies means that the signal level indoor is not as good as when you have low frequencies. And you need to, do, you need to find different ways to provide connectivity indoor. And then we also discussed about uh, trains and, and cars. And this is also related to hard to reach places. Finally, there is a lot of work we are doing on, on security and network resilience, uh, ensuring networks are strong, resilient, and, and secure. Starting from uh, the first part, supporting MNO investment, um, this gives you this slide gives you an idea um, of the spectrum that is used today for mobile services in UK. I have to acknowledge that for people that are not working in Spectrum, this slide might seem a bit confusing, but the main message is that today Spectrum for 4G ranges from frequencies that are uh, at 800 megahertz up to 2.6 uh, megahertz. 5G is going to be between f um, 700 megahertz, so a bit below, uh, up to frequencies that are very high, that are in this range, that are called millimeter wave frequencies. And the benefit with millimeter wave frequencies is that you can uh, transmit with a very high data rate and very low latency. For example, Misha said that one way to reduce latency is to send video that is not compressed, uncompressed video. But then you need a much higher bandwidth. And you need to use frequencies that are higher than the frequencies that are traditionally used because there is more space here. Yeah. There is more bandwidth available. And uh, we have already auctioned part of the spectrum for 5G, which is the 3638 uh, band, but it was auctioned uh, last year. And there is going to be a new auction either later this year or at the beginning of next year for 700 megahertz spectrum and 3638 spectrum. 
At the same uh, time, we are also releasing spectrum that is very high in frequency, so four millimeter wave. And these bands are already available today. And these bands are going to be available very soon. But the main message is that 5G is not only about new spectrum bands, but is also about shared spectrum. So rather than you having your own spectrum, you can share the spectrum frequencies with, with someone else. And it's also about using spectrum that was used for 2G, 3G, or 4G now with, uh, for, for 5G. And whenever we uh, go out with an auction, we need always uh, to think about the different trade-offs um, between the different requirements. And um, I mentioned about uh, sustaining strong competition in mobile markets. And one example is network sharing. Today there are two different network uh, sharing agreements between two and two of the operators. And it always comes, but there is always a benefit because costs are going down, but at the same time you need to keep uh, competition intensity high in, in, in the market. And, and on a case-by-case -case basis, basis, we look at the balance between competition and, and the other requirements. But it's also, we also need to look at uh, efficient allocation of spectrum, which means whenever we make a choice about how we are going to release spectrum, well, let's see, probably for 20 years, uh, we're not going to be able to go back and say, oh, you know what, we got it wrong. Uh, let's do it in a different way. So well, wh whatever we do is evidence-based. We consult, we get the responses from our stakeholders, and, and then we, we take an action. And also on mobile coverage, in particular in, uh, in hard-to-reach areas, we also need to look at different frequencies. So 5G is not only about very high frequencies like uh, 3.5 or millimeter away, but 700 megahertz low frequencies that were previously used for television will play a major role because these frequencies, these low frequencies can travel farther, so reach places that are farther and also penetrate better indoor. Second uh, uh, set of actions is about uh, encouraging new entrants and enabling new services. So it's, it's basically about lowering the barriers for new services to be deployed by, thank you, by, by new players. And I wanted to give you some examples. Of all, some, some of these examples were already covered in the previous presentations. In addition to Industry 4.0, um, or Society 5.0, or Internet of Skills, you can also think about um, use, case in, uh, use cases in agriculture, for example, Connected Farm. And there is a very uh, good research project in, in, in UK, it is called Rural 5G, or 5G Rural, which is looking at how to connect cows, for example, to, to get data from to optimize um, the, the way uh, farms work. Um, but it's about connecting also hard to reach places like uh, um, um, oil rigs or, or, or miners uh, to use very simple sensors with a battery that can last for years and years. But more simply, it's also about connecting local communities. So this is, this is very important. As I said in the previous slide, there are still local communities with, uh, without a good connection. And it's not only about uh, new services, but it's also about um, new ways uh, of delivering those services and about new business models. Today, we are here, public network. This is, this is the way 4G is delivered simply by a public networks. It's very rare to find a private network for 4G, although this model is, is emerging. But with 5G, we see um, a whole new set of models in the middle, ranging from uh, hybrid solutions into uh, third-party providers. So someone else that is deploying a support neutral host solution, so like small cell that is um, hosting the networks for all the four uh, MNOs to the case of a private network, which could be, for example, a car manufacturing plant where they're using their own network. It's private because they don't want to go in the public 
method we want to keep the data inside the factory we don't want to use any public cloud and from a spectrum perspective and this is similar to to one of the previous presentation in a similar way as Japan we're also looking at uh, new bands to to do it and in, in, for UK the main band is a 3.8 4.2 band which is a share band for local uh, uses now going to going to rural areas and hard to reach places um, I, I work in the technology team so my the majority of the time I spend at work is about looking at how new technologies could improve connectivity in rural areas. But I have to say, it's not only about technology. There are different uh, levers uh, that we could use, ranging from new technologies. Some of them are already available. Uh, but it's about understanding how these technologies that are already available can be used for rural areas. One example is Massimo, Maimo, that is being uh, designed to improve speed but it could be redesigned to improve coverage but then there are some disruptive technologies for example using low orbit satellites or drones but there are also ways of, of improving coverage in rural areas that are not technology related like um, subsidies or, 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 or like uh, um, infrastructure sharing between operators and, and so on and we also always need to find the right balance between, between the two. It is not only about uh, rural areas, but it's also about trains or, or uh, B roads or roads in rural areas. One, uh, one project we have running at the moment is basically we are measuring quality of service in some of the trains that are running uh, in UK, and we are understanding how good or how bad in some cases is the experience for users in the trains. And then we uh, work with the government in a way to find solutions to, to improve connectivity, which is about, uh, for example, using new spectrum bands or using new ways of developing or deploying cells along the rail track. So like in these pictures on, on the left side, using innovative solutions on the train rooftop, like aggregators that are taking the signal from all the operators, summing it together, and then using Wi-Fi to to connect inside the train but also we're also looking at how to improve as i, as I said at the beginning fix broadband um, together with wi-fi as an alternative to 5g and what, what i wanted to emphasize for in this slide is that there is a target that the government has to uh, have 15 million premises to be connected with full fiber by 2025 and nationwide coverage by 2053. And having fiber get into the house is not sufficient because then from the house, you need a wireless system to distribute uh, the signal inside the house. And, and, and this is Wi-Fi, although there are other technologies that are emerging that are using the same bands. And um, in 2017, we were the first country in Europe to open another band for Wi-Fi, which is a 5.8 years band. And at the moment, we are also following studies to uh, open other bands of 6 gigahertz. But at the same time, there are new disruptive technologies that are emerging that could be used, like uh, using LEDs instead of Wi-Fi, or, or using telecommunication, using very high uh, frequencies to do it, although this is going to be more in the future. Finally, uh, security. So on, on security. Um, our role here is to work together with ECMS, uh, the government, and uh, NCSC, uh, who are the experts on security in, in UK, to make sure networks are secure and secure and, and reliable. In particular, what we do is that we enforce security, and, and these are some examples of activities we are doing at the moment. Um, for example, we are monitoring uh, how um, uh, operators are implementing security measures. And we are, I think this, this is quite interesting, this cyber security testing scheme. So basically we simulate cyber, cyber attacks to uh, networks. 
Um, there is one slide that is a bit more technical, um, but the message here is there are, there are a lot of discussions on whether 5G is going to be more or less secure than, than 4G, and this is our assessment. From a technology perspective, 5G is more secure than 4G. Although some of the first deployments that are going to come to the market this year are still using 4G as an anchor. Um, they are so-called non-standalone 5G deployments. But when, when the first standalone 5G deployments are going to come into the market pos possibly next year, then we can, we can say with confidence that 5G is going to be, standalone 5G is going to be more secure than, than 4G. Some other people are saying that the attack surface, so attack surface means the way a, the different routes attacks could come from. So the attack surface is uh, increasing with 5G with respect to 4G. Well, it's not true in general because the attack surface is increasing in any case. The moment you have IoT, uh, you have the moment you have different types of devices, attached to the network, that's where more attacks can can come from. And another point uh, Misha men mentioned is 5G is software based uh, and therefore is more uh, is, is less secure. Um, yes, it could have some risks, but at the same time, if you deploy it in the right way, it could have also some benefits, some additional benefits with respect to 4G. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you.